Tonight on Bridge City News, the social media debate over Lethbridge's supervised consumption site is heating up as police investigate death threats directed at a local neighboring business owner. A Lethbridge woman with terminal brain cancer says a special type of cannabis oil has removed the remaining part of her tumor. We have the story coming up. And the rain paused long enough today to allow for good crowds at the Calgary Stampede Parade. Your nation your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Paul Arthur. Good evening, thanks for joining us. The ongoing debate in Lethbridge over the supervised consumption site has been heating up once again on social media. A June 27th Arches post claims the comments, pictures and videos a local business owner has been circulating online serve only to, quote, shame and dehumanize people who are already vulnerable and marginalized. Outspoken neighboring business owner Doug Hamilton is not named in the post, but it seems likely that he is the intended recipient, as he does have a YouTube channel that live streams security camera footage of the activity of addicts outside of Hamilton's Carpet One and Arches. Hamilton says he has received death threats since the June 27th post, and police are now investigating. Southern Alberta's Blood Tribe will be receiving $150 million by the end of summer to settle a historic claim that the federal government devastated the Blood Tribe's cattle industry over a century ago. Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett and Chief Roy Fox held a signing ceremony yesterday in Calgary. The claim deals with Crown mismanagement of the reserve's cattle ranching assets from 1894 to 1923. Both Fox and Bennett agreed it was important to correct historic wrongs on the road to reconciliation. Most of the money will be used for capital projects, while $27 million will be distributed to the residents in the southern Alberta community. Stats Canada says the unemployment rate across Canada rose by 0.1% in June compared to May. But here in Lethbridge, Medicine Hat regions, the monthly unemployment rate has dropped by 0.3%. Trevor Lewington, CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge, says the summer weather is adding sunshine to the local economy. We did see the monthly unemployment rate drop from 6.5 to 6.2 percent locally, so that's an improvement for the Lethbridge Medicine Hat region, so that's good news. Uh, we have seen actually the fourth consecutive month of increase in the labour force participation rate, so that's a technical way of saying there are more people actively working, so that's good news. And where we're seeing the most improvements is in sectors like construction, uh, as well as education and social assistance, which, you know, not entirely surprising this time of year that as the weather warms up that we get some seasonal improvement in construction and things like agriculture. It was 100 years ago on December 27, 1919 that Coaldale was formally established. While the actual anniversary is still a few months off, the town of Coaldale decided to integrate the 100th anniversary with this year's Settler Days. Of course, it wouldn't be Settler Days without the Candy Parade. That goes at 11 a.m. tomorrow. The weekend will also include music performances by Trevor Panzak and also the Chevelles and a firework display. The festival runs through to Sunday. A Lethbridge woman with terminal brain cancer has surprised the medical community after using a specific form of cannabis oil that she says has removed the remaining part of her tumor. Ainsley O'Reilly has the details. Sherry Ann Baker is convinced that a form of cannabis oil called Rick Simpson has shrunk the remaining part of a golf ball sized tumor in her brain. Her last MRI says that the tumor is completely cleared and her most recent medical report even used words like unremarkable. I do uh, one gram of Rick Simpson oil a day, and this is keeping me alive. I had no radiation, I've had no chemo, I've refused it. They've like pushed it on me several times, and I keep telling them absolutely not, because with my research and talking to other people, to doctors, other cancer patients, to growers, to activists, to, to God, there's so many of us out there, Cannabis heals. The oil contains a higher amount of THC, a component of marijuana that makes you feel high. The government of Canada is set to make edibles and hash legal in October, but Rick Simpson oil will remain illegal. Sherry Ann does not care. I don't know if that'll ever become legal, and that's why we need people to listen to our stories because it needs to be legal and people need to start getting behind us and supporting us and helping us because it is a cure for cancer and there's hundreds if not thousands of people out there that are, are still living because of it but are too afraid to talk about it 
But you know what? When I was told two years ago that I have five to ten years to live at most, even with my tumor removed, I don't care if it's illegal or not. It's saving my life, and I'm going to tell as many people as I can. Melissa Rolston, CEO of Team MD, a holistic company that works with patients and their specific health care needs, says that when it comes to cannabis as medicine, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Eventually, in time, cannabinoid therapy being prescribed alongside chemo treatments that's done in a way that's similar to chronic pain patients being prescribed opioids with cannabinoid therapy to reduce their opioid, um, the amount of opioid that they're taking. And I really think that that, that could be a possibility with cancer. Sherry Ann eats clean and is in exceptional shape. All choices that she says are easy to make when fighting for her life. I work out every day. I was in the gym. I was in the gym two weeks after I had brain surgery, okay? Seriously. And, and yeah, like I said, it was a bit of a process. I staggered and, and I stumbled, but I became strong because I had to become, become strong. And I became a fighter because I have to f fight, because I want to live. And this is what I've done. And, and I just want other people to know my story. Like I said, I'm not God. God forbid. I am not God. But this is all I've done. I mean, it's not all I've done. I've worked hard, you know, and, and you have to be very disciplined. But like I said, I want to live. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. Still on the topic of cancer after years of helping those in need, pet therapist Brian Shields might have made his last visit with his birds due to his own deteriorating health. Loris Alexander has that story. Brian Shields is no stranger to getting media attention. He is known in the city for his work with Abby, his cockatoo who escaped years ago and has since passed. The bird picnic started kind of for two reasons. One is a memorial to Abby that um, to just keep her, her, her memory alive. And then a bunch of the clients really enjoy the bird visits. Exactly one week ago, Shields received devastating news. He was diagnosed with kidney cancer. They were rather matter of fact about it, that, you know, especially the ER doctor, it was just kind of blunt. The urologist, you know, rides motorbikes. We had a little motorcycle chat for 10 minutes first before we got down. Shield says he's passionate about two things, birds and bikes. I actually got a motorcycle license before a car license. I went from a learner's to a class six. Um, so I've had bikes basically my entire adult life. For several years, Shields was planning a cross-country motorcycle trip, but says now with the diagnosis, it will be challenging. In the next six, eight weeks, I was planning to leave, just get a few more paychecks on, on, under the belt that the bike's done and prepped. And it was just a matter of saving the, the fuel and other expenses for the trip to top up the, the account for the, for the trip. And then if I'm going to lose six to eight weeks, it sounds like, after the kidney's out, that it uh, doesn't look hopeful for the trip. The Western Canadian Baseball League will play its all-star game for the first time in over 20 years. Four players from the Lethbridge Bulls have been selected. Ben Irwin, Jaden Griffin, Ashton Roy, and Caleb Warden. Head coach Jesse Sawyer says he is proud of his team. They're all pretty good choices. Um, you know, there's a couple more that could have been close. They're kind of on the bubble, but four good choices from the Bulls for sure. I'm excited for it. I mean, I know a couple of our guys are pretty excited for it too. We just don't know what exactly is going to happen up there or how it's going to go. When we play, there's a guy or two that, you know, I played against in high school or a guy on our team knows him and then I met him one time. And, you know, it just seems like it's such a small community that you have a connection with every team or I know a coach on a team. Like, you know what I mean? It's it's incredible how many people you know from each and every team. The game will be played in Edmonton on July 7th. The rain stopped just before the Calgary Stampede Parade started rolling this morning. This year's parade marshal is actress Amber Marshall from the TV series Heartland. Today's parade featured 32 floats, more than 200 horses, and 19 marching bands from around the world. Premier Kenny was riding in his very first parade since winning April's election. 
you know what, Calgarians, we've been through some, some challenging years recently, but we put all that aside to get together, celebrate our Western heritage, and I'm just I'm just pumped to be doing so. There's always been, at the side of the party, some business done, stampede time of the year. We're holding, hosting an investment forum. We've got major global investors coming in here, and I, I hope that we, I, I feel the signs of some economic uh, renewal, and I hope Stampede will help that to take off. Alberta plans to spend $2.5 million on an inquiry to shed light on foreign organizations that it says are bankrolling campaigns against the energy industry. Premier Kenny says some environmental groups are using the help in their efforts to keep Alberta's oil and gas from reaching new markets. We want to understand what exactly lies behind this campaign to defame and landlock Canadian energy. That's why I'm pleased to announce today the launch of a formal public inquiry into all facets of the foreign-funded and directed attempts to landlock our energy, including, but not exclusive to, the tar sands campaign. It will investigate all of the national and international connections, follow the money trail, and expose all of the interests involved. It will find out if any laws have been broken and recommend legal and policy actions where appropriate. Most importantly, it will serve notice that Alberta will no longer allow hostile interest groups to dictate our economic destiny as one of the most ethical major producers of energy in the world. Opposition NDP member Darren Billis says the inquiry is the equivalent of hiring someone to do a glorified Google search. Canada's Natural Resources Minister says the government isn't going to jump at the first offer from Indigenous groups for a stake in the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Amarjeet Sohi says Ottawa is a long way from looking at serious offers for the pipeline, and it plans to hold discussions with Indigenous groups in Vancouver, Victoria, Edmonton and Kamloops later this month. An Indigenous-led group called Project Reconciliation has announced it could be ready as early as next week to make a $6.9 billion bid for a majority ownership of the pipeline. So he also says he expects there will be another court challenge of the government's approval of the Trans Mountain expansion last month for a second time. Seismologists are examining data on three tremors that hit under the ocean between Haida Gwaii and the northern tip of Vancouver Island this morning. They want to determine if it's a swarm sequence or an aftershock sequence. A swarm sequence is a sudden outbreak of seismic activity. The tremors follow yesterday's magnitude 6.2 quake that was centered in the Pacific Ocean west of Bella Bella. An Ontario cabinet minister who sparked outrage over her handling of an autism program reportedly launched into a profane tirade against Ottawa Senator's owner Eugene Melnick at a Rolling Stones concert last weekend. Lisa McLeod says she has apologized for being so blunt in giving Melnick some, quote, feedback about the state of the hockey team. But the Ottawa Citizen reports McLeod yelled at Melnick that she is his minister and swore at him, calling him a loser. Premier Doug Ford later called Melnick, which was apparently well received, but he did single out McLeod on Twitter saying that her response takes no accountability for her actions. The federal government has unveiled plans to build a climate change research centre in Veterans Affairs Minister Lawrence McCauley's PEI riding. The facility will cost $14.5 million, with money coming from the federal and provincial governments and the University of Prince Edward Island. It will include state-of-the-art equipment and a living laboratory with access to nearby wetlands, forests and coastal habitats. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer wants Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to take a harder line on China. He has sent Trudeau a letter urging the PM to step up inspections on all products from China and to consider imposing tariffs on Chinese imports. China has detained two Canadians and suspended imports of Canadian meat products and canola in apparent retaliation for Canada's arrest of a Chinese high-tech executive wanted on a U.S. extradition warrant. U.S. President Donald Trump says he is considering an executive order to try to force inclusion of a citizenship question as part of the 2020 census. Trump says that it is among four or five options he is considering as he pushes the issue. The government has already begun the process of printing the census questionnaire without that question. There have been numerous roadblocks to adding the question, including last week's Supreme Court ruling that blocked its inclusion, at least temporarily. We're thinking about doing that. It's one of the ways. We have four or five ways we can do it. It's one of the ways, and we're thinking about doing it very seriously. We're doing well in the census. No, he made a statement. He wrote something out. The judge didn't like it. I have a lot of respect for Justice Roberts, but he didn't like it. But he did say, come back. Essentially, he said, 
Come back. That's what he was saying. So we'll see what happens. We can also add an addition on so we can start the printing now and maybe do an addendum after we get a positive decision. So we're working on a lot of things, including an executive order. An executive order would not by itself override court rulings, but would possibly give administration lawyers a new basis to try to persuade federal courts that the question could be included. Well, July 4th celebrations in Indiana turned into a tense waiting game last night. After a young boy watching fireworks in Evansville fell more than 20 feet into a water-filled drain pipe. A crowd watched as rescuers improvised by lowering a swing set seat into the pipe and finally pulled him up safely. The boy was not injured besides cuts and scrapes. As part of the Summer Family Fun Series, Land Before Time and Paddington 2 make a return appearance to the theater. Tickets for these films are only $1. Now, here's a look at this week's Movie Mill Minutes. Land Before Time. Littlefoot the dinosaur is orphaned after his mother perishes while protecting him from a vicious carnivore. With her last breath, she tells him how to get to the legendary Great Valley, where he will be reunited with his kind. Ah! He is talking. No, it isn't. You should not eat talking trees. No, no, no. Paddington 2. Settled in with the Brown family, Paddington Bear is a popular member of his community who spreads joy wherever he goes. One fine day, a thief steals a special item from the antique shop that Paddington was going to purchase for his Aunt Lucy's 100th birthday. He embarks on an epic quest to unmask the culprit. I've had a brilliant idea. I'm going to get a job and buy that book for Aunt Lucy's birthday. Hello, window cleaner. Ow. Dark Phoenix. During a life-threatening rescue mission, one of the most beloved X-Men characters, Jean Grey, is hit by a cosmic force that transforms her into one of the most powerful mutants of all. She spirals out of control, tearing the X-Men family apart and threatens to destroy the planet. She should be dead. Did you hear what the kids are calling you? Phoenix. Hello, Jean. Who are you? The better question is... Who are you? It looks like we are in for a few showers before we get to enjoy some sunshine with warmer temperatures. The forecast is coming right up. Taking a look at our seven-day forecast, partly cloudy with fog patches developing overnight and a low of nine degrees. For tomorrow, a mix of sun and cloud with a 30% chance of showers in the afternoon with a risk of a thunderstorm and a high of 27. For Sunday, we'll see a mix of sun and cloud and a high of 23 degrees. And Monday, a 30% chance of showers with a high of 20 before we get into warmer weather on Tuesday. Sunny skies, in fact, for the rest of the week with highs of 24 on Tuesday, 28 on Wednesday, and 25 on Thursday. Looking at the Almanac, the average high for this time of year is 25 with an average low of 10. Highest temperature in this state was recorded in 2007 at 36 degrees. Our record low was 4 degrees in 2003. Sunrise was at 531 and sunset at 941. Looking at the national forecast for tomorrow, Victoria is expecting a high of 20 with a 40% chance of showers. For Vancouver, a high of 18 with some showers. Calgary will be expecting a 17 degree high with a 60% chance of showers and a risk of a thunderstorm for Stampede. In Edmonton, 19 degrees with clouds and a 60% chance of showers, also a risk of a thunderstorm. Over in Regina and Saskatoon, a high of 25 with a 30% chance of showers with a risk of thunderstorm activity. Winnipeg will see some sunshine in 26, and in Toronto, a heat warning is in effect. They're expecting a high of 29 tomorrow and a 60% chance of showers and thunderstorms. And in Ottawa, a high of 30 degrees and a 60% chance of showers and similar temperatures in Montreal. Fredericton will be 32 with showers. For Halifax, a mix of sun and cloud and 30 degrees. In Charlottetown, expect a 30% chance of showers and 26 degrees. And in St. John's, Newfoundland, sunny and 24. 
The jobless rate edged up a notch from 5.4 percent in May to 5.5 percent, but that's still near a 40-year low. Statistics Canada reports the economy lost 2,200 jobs in June, surprising economists who had predicted a gain of 10,000. Even with this small decline, the economy churned out 248,000 new positions in the first half of the year. That's the strongest six-month stretch of job growth to start a year since 2002. The U.S. economy added 224,000 jobs in June following weak job growth in May. The burst of hiring may suggest that employers are shaking off concerns about weaker global growth. The U.S. unemployment rate now stands at 3.7 percent, up from 3.6 percent in May. Analysts believe the strength of the jobs report could complicate the Federal Reserve's decision later this month on whether to cut interest rates to help support the economy. Britain's competition watchdog is investigating Amazon's purchase of a big stake in food delivery service Deliveroo. The deal hasn't been billed as a takeover by Amazon, but the watchdog says it suspects the agreement could result in Amazon and Deliveroo ceasing to be distinct. The investigation comes as U.S. authorities take steps to rein in the growing power of large tech firms. Both Amazon and Deliveroo pledged today to work closely with regulators. Now here's a look at today's markets. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, the social media debate over Lethbridge's supervised consumption site is heating up once again as police investigate death threats directed at a local neighboring business owner. The teen years can be a challenging time for many. A new film, Because of Gracia, profiles a handful of high school students navigating these challenges. Eden Shimoda sat down with Canadian filmmaker Tom Symes to talk about this film with an uplifting message. That's next. But first, here's a look at what's happening in and around your community. Here's your Bridge City News community calendar. Come out to Gull Gardens and enjoy Shakespeare in the Park 2019 every Thursday and Friday from now until August 9th. The Lethbridge Shakespeare Performance Society presents the action-packed and exciting play, Macbeth. Suitable for all ages, shows are free with an opportunity to donate. Experience the timeless magic of one of Shakespeare's best-known plays. For more information, call Kate at 403-329-4568. Devil's Cooley Dinosaur and Heritage Museum, located in Warner, Alberta, is now open until September 2nd. Take a tour of the Dinosaur Gallery, Heritage Exhibits, and Military Displays. Visit Charlie the Baby Dinosaur, dig in a simulated bone bed, and see an actual nesting site. For more information, visit devilcooley.com. Lethbridge Legal Guidance is a nonprofit society offering free legal advice to low income Southern Albertans. It holds clinics on Tuesdays from 5 to 7 p.m. by appointment only. Some of the areas the society assists in include family, criminal, traffic, immigration, EI, and other issues. For more information, call 403 380 6338 or email Lethbridge Legal Guidance at telus.net. And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. We all know that teenage years are filled with confusion, tough decisions, and the need for guidance. One film, Because of Gracia, profiles a handful of high school students navigating life, love, faith, and truth. Eden Shimoda sat down with Canadian filmmaker and director Tom Symes to hear his inspiration for the film and his passion for contemporary films with an uplifting message. 
I'm here with Tom Symes, Canadian filmmaker, incredible high school teacher, and one of the nicest guys. Tom, thanks so much for being with us today. I am thrilled to be on the Miracle Channel. Oh, I'm excited. It was just so lovely getting to meet you and your wife yeah. and just chatting before and yeah. just hearing all about your passion for this movie and how it came to be. And so I'm excited that today's viewers get a chance to hear from your heart and hear how this came to be. I think that's so cool when you get a behind the scenes look. Mm. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed this film. It was really exciting watching the journey of the different teenagers yeah. and kind of what they go through. Um, I would love it if you would just let us know how this film came to be, kind of how you got into film. Yeah, good question. So in the 1990s, I had a drama troupe and we traveled all over Western Canada and we uh, had plays that dealt with chastity, courtship and sanctity of life. And as that was happening in, in the, the large evangelical church I was going to, I noticed a lot of the kids, once they finished high school, were leaving the church. And it bothered me. My kids were very, very young, so it wasn't impacting me yet, but I was thinking, why? And by the end of the 1990s, I was a high school teacher. I was teaching phys ed, and I was coaching football and wrestling. But I noticed a lot of the Christians seemed to go what I thought of as underground. They, they felt very uncomfortable sharing what they really believed in the school setting. And um, that was that, those, were, those two things really impacted me. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a play in 2001 called G-Factor, and it was, it, it was actually the genesis for the movie because of Gracia. And at the time, I never thought I'd ever be a filmmaker. I never thought I'd get into drama. I grew up being a, I was an athlete in high school and university, and uh, I started writing plays in the 90s. Wouldn't tell my friends because they were all athletes. They thought, <laughs> you're getting into the art times, what's going on? But by uh, the late 90s, I let go, and I, I, I realized that I was moving into the arts. God was moving me there. and. Uh, Right around uh, the turn of the century, right around 2000, I started doing some film work, and it got larger and larger. In 2005, I actually started Five Stones Films, and we produced our first feature, Season of Dreams, a sports documentary on football, and it just kept snowballing. And so all these years later, all of a sudden, I realized I've got five feature films, and the last one was because of Gracia. So I don't know. It's, it was a God thing. That's amazing. Yeah. I just absolutely enjoyed this movie. and. I think you did such a great job of tackling some important key issues mm. that teenagers deal with today. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, some of the parents and grandparents, we don't really have a true understanding of what it's like um, at high school these days and kind of some of the things that they deal with when it comes to peer groups and, and school and just some of the decisions that they're faced with, especially as a Christian. Um, and um, could you talk a little bit more about that, about kind of some of the key issues that you sure. chose to include in the movie and, and why those were important to you? Yeah, about five years ago, I interviewed a, a, a young lady I taught in Saskatoon, Sarah Grote. She was a beautiful Christian gal, went through high school. And at the very end of her high school career, I wanted to interview her and ask her what her high school experience was like being a Christian going through high school. And uh, she got very serious with me, and I actually uh, taped it as a documentary. And, I, and uh, she said, uh, Mr. Symes, I barely made it. Uh, each year, it, my faith was getting eroded every single year. And uh, what I have seen over the last almost three decades of teaching is that uh, Christians are going more and more underground with their faith. Mm -hmm. uh, they're feeling like they can't be part of, of uh, sort of the global conversation uh, because they don't have the right thoughts or the right ideas. And as secular humanism has sort of encroached on us, uh, they really are being marginalized. And I feel like a film like Because of Gracia, first of all, helps them understand who they are. So in that sense, there's an empathy uh, factor involved. Uh, the other thing is I, I think the film really challenges young people, especially when Gracia uh, is uh, debating her high school debate teacher mm -hmm. on creation versus evolution. And really the creation evolution debate wasn't really what I wanted to get across. At the end of the debate, uh, when Gracia has her monologue, she's really saying that, hey, I don't get to share my ideas right. in the marketplace and I want to be able to share with you what I actually believe, but yeah. I'm going to be shut down or mocked. Um, and uh, so it's, it's like we're not allowing this voice to happen. And kids, they empathize with that, but they're also challenged by it. And it's kind of like, okay, there's moments every single day where I could actually share what I believe. Am I going to have the strength to do it? And when they see Gracia do that with grace mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just with passion, they go, you know what? If I have grace and passion, I can share my ideas as well and I can lay it out there. And the last thing about it is I think it inspires them. It's mm -hmm. like 
Chase is one of these guys who is so much like a lot of the kids I teach. He's, he's internalized everything. Uh, he's himself when he's in his bedroom and he's you know, getting ready to be with Grassi and he's like this, but when he gets out into the real world, he's so careful. And it's almost a fear factor. He's afraid mm -hmm. of what people are going to think about him. He's afraid of really who he really is. And the film, in many ways, inspires kids like that. They go, wow, I'm like Chase. I, I, need, I need to start doing this. Mm -hmm. I love that you tackle that freedom of speech. Uh, in the movie because it's such a hot topic in our culture today and and people you know so strongly want to uh, stand up for their truth might not necessarily be the truth but sure. it's you know their truth and and I see what you're saying you know there are a lot of Christians who feel a bit like oh if I don't have the right words or, or I don't know if I'll look really silly if I say something but I think the movie does such a good job of giving confidence to your convictions and and just going for it and just sharing. But um, in regards to freedom of speech, why was that so important for you to kind of kind of hit the nail on the head for, for Christians watching? Well, you know, going back to the play in 2001, I saw that happening, you know, it, it's hard to believe almost 20 years ago. I, I saw the freedom of speech issue becoming big mm -hmm. in the public school system. And it's, it's, it's become even larger in the last 20 years. And what I, what I think of it like is like the Christian kids are being painted into a little corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, really what they're being told, the narrative is, uh, just shut up and listen because we have the answers for you. And you know, uh, life is not that simple. And when it, when it really comes down to, uh, the kids have convictions around the issues around sexuality, around chastity and courtship. They have convictions around uh, the abortion issue if they're pro-life. Uh, they have uh, issues around even science. Mm -hmm. And all these issues, they, they feel like they have a voice, but the, the larger narrative from the culture at large, whether it's media or journalism or even academia, is, hey, these are the right answers, and if you're outside of those answers, right. we're gonna attach isms and phobias to you and I, I really resent that for the kids sake yeah. because I really feel like they should be able to share those those ideas. Absolutely and it's important to get the conversation going and to and to not let the loudest voice in the room be the only voice right. Yeah. Um, you did refer a bit to um, undercover Christians can you tell us a little bit more about your experience with that is that something you saw as a teacher um, with some of your your Christian students and what do you think I don't know, did you see anyone along that journey that kind of, like in the movie, they get more confidence and what, what did it, what helped them kind of, kind, of, kind of come out of being an undercover Christian? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I've seen over my teaching career is I've seen gracias, male, female and males, by the way, all the way through my career. Uh, these Christian young people that have a voice, that have the confidence to share what they share, never in a boisterous, I have the answers kind of way, but, it, but graceful like gracia. Um, I was at a high school five years ago. I had two gracias in a row. They actually are part of the composite of the gracia character, but they were two young men. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I saw happen, the way they lived out their faith in a very secular environment, was that they actually impacted those undercover Christian kids. Okay. And all of a sudden they were going, oh, I'm like him. I could be more like him. Yeah. And so for me, uh, the, uh, the character of Chase Morgan, who is really a composite of most of the Christian kids I've taught, probably... 70%. Uh, they get really encouraged by Gracia because they have friends like that, but they also get encouraged to be more who they are in the school mm -hmm. setting. Hard to do though, because uh, there's a lot of pressure to, to be like everyone else. And I think that, uh, you know, the other factor is to have teachers that have confidence in themselves. And my uh, youngest daughter is going to be a a teacher. She's at Trinity Western University, just finished her third year of education. It's going to be amazing. Awesome. And I, but I have Christian friends that say, why? Are you nuts? She's going to go into the public school system. I said, exactly. Yeah. You know, the darker the night is, the stronger that light is. That one candle is going to be brighter. And I, and yeah, and I really feel as Christians, we need to be in the public school system, be Absolutely. part of that conversation. I need to be gracia for those undercover Christians so that yeah. they have confidence when they're in my class. And I think that happens on a daily basis. Um, but the undercover Christian is, is not going to change unless we have films like Because of Gracia, mm -hmm. really, that show them and model things that they need. You know, we have TV shows like Riverdale, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we have all these, all these, role modeling for young people that are so much the opposite of what they actually need. They need something that lifts them rather right. than takes them down. Right. And, and uh, so that's what I'm thrilled with with the movie. You know, you talked about um, 
kind of the gracias, the people who are strong in their faith, who can speak up, who aren't perfect or boisterous, but um, make a difference and, and cause other Christians to kind of rally with them and yeah. feel like, okay, if she can do this, I can do this. And it really reminds me of something that we've come to, to phrase here is spirit contemporary. Huh. And um, it's a phrase we use here a lot, just reminding us to be spirit contemporary as Christians, whereas full of God's spirit, full of his power, full of his miracles, but being relevant and contemporary to the people around us. And, you know, not not becoming religious or judgmental or pointing our finger sure. or, you know, and I think this movie really embodies that. And, um, you know, why do you think it's such a valuable message in the 21st century to be contemporary, but yet to not let down on your conviction? Sure. Well, I, I think, first of all, uh, the media has a profound influence on all of us, not just Absolutely. young people, you know, whether it's social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, but the, the mainstream media through film, mm -hmm. through television, uh, journalism, I mean, that connects to us, uh, academia. But what's encouraging to me is I believe that everything is downstream from popular culture mm -hmm. and that even the church in many ways for young people is downstream. And that's why all these kids were leaving the church when I was in the 90s that I went to is because the culture, the popular culture was more important to them than the church. And so I think that we have to take the fight to where the kids are. Mm -hmm. Let's take it to the movie theaters. Our movie uh, screened in the U.S. in uh, 35 theaters. Did amazingly well, by the way. And we were so excited about that. But we need to take the mainstream media. Yep. Uh, we need to take popular culture. Our movie's entertaining. I, we, I know that. But it's also got some incredible messaging. We need to take that straight to the homes. Yeah. Uh, we need to take the DVD. We need to take that into the homes. And, and we need to show this to our kids over and over again and give them an alternative to what they have. You know, there's so many ways that this um, movie can go on to impact a lot of people. And you mentioned, you know, future projects. So this isn't, you know, this wasn't just a one and done. You've got more in your heart to do. Sure, yeah. I've got a, a film I'm working on right now called Breathing Room. And it's, it's about another family of faith uh, that's dealing with cystic fibrosis. And most families... I think all families deal with an unwanted guest coming into their home, whether it's mental illness, uh, whether it's drug or alcohol abuse, or whether it's a disease. Uh, we have my, my youngest daughter, uh, she has type 1 diabetes. That's a guest that came in that's never going to leave. And in the case of cystic fibrosis, it's another guest that comes in. How do you deal with that as a family of faith? And it's a beautiful story, and it uh, covers four decades, uh, and it's inspiring. Um, and that's what that's. I really believe that that's what Five Stones Films is supposed to do. We're supposed to create this inspiring narrative that really supports uh, families of faith, mm -hmm. and and so it fits into sort of uh, uh, the genre that we want to continue doing. And uh, I appreciate the fact that you love because of Gracia. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think you know. I agree with you, you know, we need to have a strong voice in the media and we need to be uh, an excellent voice, a very yes. a powerful, a very creative, a very almost surprising. And I yes. love it when the Christian world surprises people because um, Jesus was a man of excellence. He, he, you know, crowds drew to him, which means he was very relatable, very contemporary, that people felt his love, people felt his acceptance, his forgiveness. And I think through movies like this, people um, have a chance to meet him. And I think that's, we have to, we have to get into mainstream media. And I just um, am so grateful for people like you who hmm. are following the call on your life and following a dream and pursuing that purpose. And, um, you know, Miracle Channel, our viewers, we believe in Christian media. <laughs> we invest in Amen. media. Uh, and here at Miracle Channel, you know, we, we have a passion for that. And so it's exciting to meet people like yourself who are also on this journey and, and who are creating such incredible content that can inspire us, that we can share um, with people. So we just want to thank you so much for being with us today and just sharing your heart. And uh, I just wanted to give you a chance to, you know, if there's anything else you wanted to share with our sure. viewers, any kind of last words or a message or anything you want to share, you just go right ahead. <laughs> sure. I guess one last thing, and I'll, I'll look directly into the yeah. camera to share this thought. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our film opened in 35 theaters in the U.S., and we actually have Gracia babies that have been born, uh, young people that went into the movie theater that were pregnant and uh, weren't aware uh, what the movie was about. They saw, they saw the journey of Bobby and, and, and being pregnant and her decision, and they decided to have their babies and called their babies Gracia. Uh, that's how impactful film is in people's lives. Uh, I don't underestimate it at all, and I don't think the folks out there should as well. Mm -hmm.
That's beautiful. That's so powerful. And again, we just want to thank Tom uh, Symes for joining us and sharing all about your powerful film. So thank you so much. Thank you. Sexual abuse and misconduct within the Christian church has been ongoing for many, many years. Now, why is it happening and, and what is the solution to the problem? Joining me now to discuss this is Reverend Tim Calloway, pastor of Daybreak Community Church in Airdrie, Alberta, and co-chair of Missionary Kids Safety Net. Pastor Tim, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you very much, Hal. I appreciate the invite. Now, we've all read the stories of clergy members sexually abusing parishioners. There's also a lot of sexual misconduct. Is this a problem we see more in the Western world, or is it a problem around the world? Unfortunately, it is a global problem. And the reason I say that is I have files today that are open files relating to cases in the Philippines, South America, Australia, the UK. Of course, uh, because we're in North America, uh, often we hear more about the North American cases and we have a natural interest in that. But unfortunately, it is a global problem. For example, the uh, organization that I represent, Missionary Kids Safety Net, was born out of uh, uh, sexual abuse taking place in missionary schools for kids in uh, various parts of the world, including Africa. And so, uh, unfortunately, it is indeed a global problem. Now, often the focus is on, on Catholic priests, but you're quick to point out that sexual abuse and misconduct by clergy is not just a Catholic problem. You say it's equally as rampant in the Protestant and evangelical world? I'll tell you why I say that, Hal. So I'm going to date myself here, but way back in 1984, when I was in my last year of seminary, I desperately needed a thesis topic. And it had to be related to a course that I was taking. And I was taking my last course, which happened to be in family counseling. And one day I'm just reading the Chicago Tribune. I was going to school in Chicago. And an article there involving a local situation where I believe the, the, the father was charged with molesting his own daughters. And it was mentioned that he was active in the local church. And uh, the reporter made the observation saying, people in the know say that statistics of sexual abuse are as, as great as, if not greater than, in the religious world than in mainstream society. Now, Hal, in my naivety at the time, my first reaction was, I don't believe that. There's the media just trying to screw the church again. But then the more I thought about it, I thought, well, maybe this is my thesis topic. I can do a survey and prove this assertion wrong. And so I went ahead and compiled a survey that met all of the clinical standards for accuracy and that sort of thing. And as I watched those uh, survey results come in, I realized we have a problem which no one knows what to do with and nobody knows how to go about properly addressing it. Now, again, that was in 1984. Remember, that was before internet. That was before much of the news had come out about the Catholic uh, priests situation. And so this question, this problem of sexual abuse really wasn't even on the horizon of the religious world, let alone mainstream society. And so in my own experience, I can go back all the way to seminary days, 1984, when I first became aware of this problem that is in the evangelical church and in the Protestant world. And since then, of course, we've discovered that it's equally um, happening in uh, not just the Catholic world, but the Protestant world as well. I guess the most common question asked is, why do clergy members commit sexual abuse and misconduct, considering these are people we're supposed to be God's representatives here on earth. You know, that's a, that's a very good question. And uh, as I've thought about that, uh, naturally it goes without saying, we're all human, we're all sinners, uh, we're all susceptible to the inevitable temptations of life. But beyond that, um, those who have served in Christian ministry know that there are some unique uh, challenges, some unique potential foibles that come to uh, a pastor. Uh, one thing that you have to wrestle with often is a sense of powerlessness. Sometimes you're up against the church board, there's politics going on in the church world, and so you're feeling very 
uh, you, you're given a lot of responsibility, but really not much authority. And so there's an element of powerlessness that can come into to play here. Of course, uh, you're also dealing with people with uh, the very intimate and uh, uh, personal details of life. And so, uh, especially, for example, in marriage counseling and that sort of thing, very often sexual relationships, that type of thing comes up. And so when you're talking about that with especially members of the opposite sex, uh, you know, sometimes uh, that's how it can happen. And so there is a unique uh, aspect to uh, being a pastor. Now, the reality is this problem is not likely to go away anytime soon. But I think public sentiment is that there should be far more serious consequences for clergy members found guilty of these crimes. What are your thoughts? I agree with that. Um, one of the, you know, and, and as we all know, it's not uh, sexual abuse, sexual misconduct is not unique to the church world, the religious world, or to pastors, coaches, teachers. We hear stories like that as well. The unique thing about uh, it happening in the church world or being perpetrated by pastors is that very often the pastor represents for better or worse, and to a greater or larger extent sometimes than others, uh, is a representative of God to people. And so they are trusted uh, as a result of that. And consequently, when a pastor perpetrates sexual abuse, when a pastor molests someone, uh, it has a way of creating and, and shaking the very foundations of people's faith in the goodness of God. And uh, so I think that's one of the reasons for that. So, Pastor Tim, you actually like to differentiate between sexual abuse and sexual misconduct. Why is that? When we use the term sexual abuse, we are referring to uh, abuse of a minor. And abuse of a minor is a crime. The term sexual misconduct we use to refer to adults or someone over 18 years of age, where the whole question of the consensuality of the incident perhaps comes into play. And so that's an important distinction because sexual abuse of a minor is a crime in all 50 states and all 10 provinces. And so that's a very important distinction. And that's why we make that distinction between sexual abuse and sexual misconduct. Now we hear that many victims are hesitant to report the abuse or misconduct. Why do you think that is? Part of the reason for that, Hal, is there's, there's a deep sense of shame that is uh, present in any kind of sexual abuse that I've ever uh, been involved with. And very often, because uh, in the case of sexual abuse, you have a minor or a child who has been wronged by an adult there's an imbalance of power there. And in addition to the shame, the child often thinks, no one's going to believe me. If I come out and say that Pastor so-and-so did this, or uh, one of the deacons, or one of the elders, or the Sunday school teacher, or whatever, no one is going to believe me because that person is viewed as a spiritual giant in this church, in this organization, uh, that type of thing. So the, the power imbalance and also the fear of not being able to be believed. Uh, when you look at the adult world, for example, uh, since I've been doing this for over 35 years now, I have talked to numerous, usually women in their 40s, 50s, 60s, who have lived with their secrets for all these years since they were children. And part of the reason for that is simply because they were so ashamed, they felt that perhaps they had encouraged it in some way, they felt that perhaps they were guilty, all of the blame should have been on them, and then no one would believe me. And so they just kept it to themselves and never told a soul until they shared it with me decades later. So if a church member is sexually abused or there's some sexual misconduct involved, how should they respond? Should they go right to the police right away or talk to maybe a clergy member first within the church? We encourage people that when we're talking about a crime or a potential crime, and that would be involving minors, go to the legal authorities immediately. Okay, put it into that realm right away. Now, one of the things that we try to encourage Christian organizations to do 
is to have a intentional policy regarding abuse of any kind. And I'm always surprised at the number of organizations that don't have that. And our advice to them is, you know what, you're just waiting for trouble. Be proactive rather than reactive, because all you need is one allegation and your entire reputation as an organization, your entire reputation as an individual, as a pastor, as a Christian leader, hangs in the balance. And people read a name in the newspaper, they never forget that. Oh, that church, oh, that guy, that, that sort of thing. So we encourage people to be proactive and have some kind of a policy so that when, God forbid, something does happen, there is a strategy in place, uh, uh, an operation in place, uh, that is is uh, t- takes a- away from the immediate emotions of the whole thing. And so uh, we're, we're always surprised, uh, however, at the number of Christian institutions that want to handle it within, want to handle it ourselves. And much as we can appreciate that, Hal, it's not wise for a number of reasons. Okay, I'll just use one example here. For example, I think most of us are aware of the uh, unfortunate circumstances at Willow Creek Church in suburban Chicago. Thankfully, that, if I can use that word, it didn't involve minors, it was uh, adults. But when the allegations came to light, uh, the allegations were brought forward and the church board was instructed, go to an outside third party independent investigator. So let me ask you something. How should a church deal then with clergy members who are repentant, maybe involved with sexual misconduct involving two adults? Some churches have reinstated people in other cities, and there is such a thing as forgiveness. What do you think? Yes. Um, an organization, uh, a church denomination that I was a part of for 15 years, for 15 years of my ministry, uh, I sat on a committee that they called the Discipline Review Committee. Anytime there was an allegation, that came to the committee. And again, we had a standard of procedure for how we went about. It would always include an interview with all of the parties, uh, an opportunity given for the, uh, the accused to present their case. And they were always uh, invited to bring uh, an advocate someone in their corner so that they didn't feel like they were up against five or six people that uh, didn't believe a word they were were about to say. Uh, However, when it involved children and the police were involved or it had already gone to court, we would not deal with the situation until after the legal authorities had finished their process. And so uh, I certainly believe in second chances. You know, the essence of our Christian theology is that God is a God of second and third chances. There's all kinds of examples in Scripture where, where that was the case. And so absolutely, we believe in that, and we would like to give everyone a second chance. However, that does not uh, take away from the importance of a thorough investigation as soon as allegations are brought forward. So what can the church do to better build a system of accountability? As I mentioned before, I think the first thing they need to do is to have some kind of a policy in place, a protocol in place, something that is uh, crafted and designed not in the uh, environment of a scandal, something that is put together long before any incident has taken place so that it's more objective. There's just a lot of value in having uh, a policy on the books that you can go to immediately. If you don't have such a policy, the job becomes 10 times more difficult for a variety of reasons. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of Christian organizations having a protocol, a standard in place for dealing with allegations. Don't ever say it's not gonna happen here. That's the worst thing you can say. Some wonder, Pastor Tim, If a contributing factor within the Catholic Church is the fact that the priests are required to remain celibate, if priests were potentially allowed to marry, do you think that would make a difference? I think it would help. I don't think it would solve the problem completely. And the reason I say that is because in the Protestant world, often the uh, perpetrator or the accused is married and ostensibly a happily married person. 
And so marriage alone is not the ultimate solution to it. I think from talking with my Catholic friends uh, and uh, uh, that sort of thing, uh, that it would certainly help uh, address that whole issue of celibacy, but I'm not convinced that in and of itself is the sole solution. Reverend Tim Calloway, pastor of Daybreak Community Church in Airdrie, Alberta, thanks a lot for your time today. I appreciate it, Hal. Thank you so much for this opportunity. On behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and have a great night.